I paint a whole lot and I wanted to make sure that I try and tape these tip, tips and hints as I can painting this tray with this foam roller that has an end on it. But you have sides to paint and you have the base to paint. What you can do is you can squish some paint on the end and then really pushing hard you can get that whole side and corner and edge all done at the same time and then just flip your roller over and roll it that way for your base coat. Whoops, and even things out. Just a nice little hint with these sponge rollers. I'm getting ready to um, trace my pattern onto my surface. One thing um, I had, graphite paper that um, I don't know if you can tell or not, but I have worn off all of the graphite. And when I trace my pattern lines, I can barely see them. And that's not the most optimum thing. You do want to use generally a worn out piece of graphite better. But I had all these pieces that have nothing left on them, and so I have to open up a brand new package. One thing that I wanted to share with you is when you open up one of these packages, and I've already snipped off a little piece of it, these come in these huge sheets. Okay, so we've got a huge monster sheet. But what happens with graphite, now I've taught a lot of students over the year, what happens with graphite paper if I was to put this giant piece of graphite, A, it, you can see how unwieldy it is, if I was to put this on this whole piece, and lay this down there and get it where I want it and then if I started tracing what's going to happen is the heel, the bony little heel right there of my hand is going to be pressing all over this piece and especially on a light color piece like this what I'm going to end up with is little black smudges worked into the surface of my paint by the time I get done tracing and that is not what we want either you want to control the damage as far as that and what if I'm tracing this and this shifts just a little bit, but I don't see that it shifts because I've got black graphite under the whole thing. I can't see my wood or anything like that. So what we do, we take this aside, and I snipped off just a little piece of it, okay? And that way, what happens is when you lay your piece out, oops, sorry, get it lined up with your pattern, and I've got lines on here that I'm lining up here. What happens with this is you're going to place that under and you're going to put your hand out here or it's not on top of that and then you'll just holding it with this other hand you're just going to lift up the side and you're going to move it over here. Now some people like to tape their piece. If you're going to tape use two pieces of tape because then you have one here and one here and what happens is um, then your pattern if you just use one piece in the middle you can skew while you're pressing on the paper and that's not good either. So what you do, and then the other thing that frequently happens is people frequently can't tell which side is up on graphite paper. So a little trick that I know of is to write the word top with a marker on the top. And that way when you see that and you can read it, you'll know, like I can't read this, this is backwards right here, so I'll know that this is the top and I can always tell which side is up. And you want to do that for your white graphite as well. And like I said, keep, keep these worn out pieces like this, because like if I was painting on a pure white surface, this would probably be perfect. The other thing that you're going to want when you're um, tracing is you're going to want a very fine tipped stylus. You don't want one of the fatter tipped styluses. Those are for different things. You can use them for dip dots or something like that. But you want the thinnest, finest line that you can get. And sometimes, like on this end, um, my tip has broken off, so I'll have to replace this tool. Um, but it's always good to use a fine-ended stylus to trace your lines. One more thing about this graphite paper, now I have my graphite paper and it's brand new and it's, it's crispy and it's very dark. The first thing that I recommend doing is taking a paper towel and anchoring it and wiping off and you'll see you'll get quite a bit of grit. Just wiping that off just to get knocking off that loose stuff and I got quite a bit off on my paper towel. And that's just the stuff you don't want sitting on top of your freshly painted surface that you've taken the time to prepare. I'm going to mix your shale green <clears throat> with your bittersweet chocolate and water it down to 80% water. And then we're going to slip slap, blot it on a paper towel, slip slap behind these leaf areas and pull it in. Don't have any sudden stop and start kind of marks. These are going to be like shadowy other kind of leaves. You can even put even more water you get to coming out to this area. 
You don't want it to be highlighted around the edges of those leaves, but you don't want to outline them either. So we get a little bit close up here. Just gently, 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 ever so softly. Put your pattern traced on just behind those leaves. This is going to be just like there's other little leafy things. You could even make them little leaf kind of um, shapes. Just to give it an impression. And we want it darker as we come up here. We want to kind of have it cascade. And we want it irregular. All kind of impressions of leaves, kind of a deal. Okay, and then we want it to come around the outer edge, you know, just kind of that little leaf kind of thing. Come out over here. Just touch it. Now we can go a little bit heavier, a little bit darker. This is just a touch of the bittersweet chocolate into that shale green. It's kind of a, a browny, yucky kind of green looking when you get it done. Mix it with water, blot it on paper towel. Oops, a little bit extra of the bittersweet. Blot. And these can be a little bit more strong. I don't want that value to get too dark out, out there. And we're cascading. And so what happens is we have this background color, and then we have that softer gray, grayed down green, then we have that browner green, and then we're going to have these green leaves on top. We'll do the same thing on this, on the top piece. Let's back you off. Okay, look at what a mess I've done to my table here. Okay, so these can be a little bit bigger because they're not such tiny leaves. Now right over your pattern, now you won't be able to take your pattern off once you do this. So you need to be aware of that. If it's something that you wanted to erase, then soften it or lighten it first. <clears throat> so you want to be aware of the flow. Let's darken behind. I'm just giving some weight. It's almost like a plate for food. It helps to support the food, you, otherwise it would fall on the floor. So this just gives it some background, the layering kind of a thing for our, our leaves. Can darken it. Just in the deeply dark areas. With a little bit of water in our brush and blot your brush. We're going to wash in a little, little bit more water. Blot your brush. I'm going to wash in our leaf um, base coats with light avocado. So it's a wash of light avocado. Go ahead and wash them all on and then we'll um, 
Maybe sand just a little bit with like a brown paper bag. Okay, and get that all washed on there. This is going to be a like, kind of light, dreamy kind of effect. One of the things that you may want to do, my graphite lines are just a little bit dark, so I want to go ahead and lighten them up just a little bit so that when you when you get paint on a graphite line that's when you can't erase it anymore so we don't want our graphite lines so dark if we touch it with this wash of paint then they're not going to come off later so we want it just light enough so we can see it even though it's a wash of paint um, it'll still make it difficult to remove in order to keep from having any um, stop and start marks when you're washing you have to keep moving the paint and you have to get it all on there while it's still wet. Okay, and if you get any kind of real choppy things, you can mop it with a little mop or your finger or something. Let's see how down here it's got these little stop and start marks. Okay, so that's kind of stuck there, but what I'm going to do, because I've got this modeled background and we're doing this thing with washes, I'm going to go ahead and leave that and when I shade and put my details in, it'll look like a dappled leaf on the base. Slap, slap a few just areas of green in a kind of a leaf shape, just here and there in this background that you've stippled. Spilling out kind of randomly here and there, just real washy. <coughs> Pardon me. Just to fill in these areas just a little bit. A hint, kind of nondescript hint. I'm wash on the grapes with more water than that. With the mauve plus our leaf base coat color. So it's just a touch, just to mute it a little bit. Really washy. I have a hard time getting this transparent enough. Um, so you put just a little bit of the light avocado into your mauve color, and that's going to tone that color down because it's the opposite on the color wheel after all. And then I'll mute that down so that it becomes a little bit more like the grape leaves. And just wash on the whole thing. Keep your grape shapes round. If you traced them crooked, make sure you keep them straight. Blot your brush and work quickly so that you don't have all those little stop and start marks. Grapes with stop and start marks would not be very attractive. So just wash, wash, wash. We're going to bring this up into the leaf up here because that leaf is hanging over that. Then out there. Okay, and so just repeat all those. You want to add a little bit of the shale green to your burnt umber and add it after you add the water for the wash. So you wash on 80% water add a touch of the shale green and then you make your lines thick thin by pressing and lifting off. We don't want these to get darker than our leaves and our um, grapes. Okay, so then they crisscross and you press and you just let your hand kind of meander. Don't follow the lines exactly because that's not necessary. And then they're going to become vines and, and um, I'm going to add some of our stems. I think that goes the other way. And shade what will be our stones. Now our stones are the pieces of the puzzle here. So we're going to shade those with burnt umber. And we just want to run right next to, and we want these to be straight, so these are going to come out straight. Whoops, not through our leaves. We're going to treat these lines as if these are the, um, the cracks in the stones. So we're not going to follow the puzzle piece. Instead, we're going to just 
not go around that little edge of the puzzle piece right there. The other thing that we want to do is we want to shade to round the corner edges of these stones. And pretend like these are old Roman stones. They've been around and walked on since the beginning of time. You can shade some, some little edges to make them look like they've been worn off and then we'll crack those and do some other fancy stuff to them. But just round those corners and treat each one of these pieces like a separate piece of stone. You're going to go all along the edge. You want it to be irregular. Don't make it regular. Make it irregular. Okay, got this. You can take your liner brush and burnt umber plus a little bit of the bittersweet chocolate together. Wash it a little bit. And be careful not to jump too fast too far. And then we'll chip out some of these corners by doing this dark mix. And that will give it the appearance of cracks. And we want to just go ahead and put a line like that all the way around on all these. Um, let's go ahead and crack this side as well. Chip that off. And by splitting that difference, I think it's going to give it a really neat look. Okay, so then we'll come up here into our other corner. Go ahead and chip that off. Okay, to crack our stones, what you can do is take a bit out of an area that you think you want to have a crack there and just pull it in. I try not to take too much attention away from you know the center of interest kind of a thing, but I think that this is just going to add detail. You want to go ahead and line where this stone is overlapping. This is like a little inset kind of a thing. Go ahead and line that. Oops. If you get a little wonky, don't worry about it because wonky is how it's going to look like it's got stones going on. Okay. Some out here and there. Round all those corners. Okay, after you get it all lined, and we've lined this outside edge as well, darken inside the bigger cracks. Not all the way out, but darken it with the bittersweet. Just on the edges, just to kind of frame it. And that will make it look like it's a deeper crack. Okay, we want to reinforce our vines thinly within the lines that you already did. They're thicker there. You make them thicker using the thinned bittersweet chocolate. No, thinned burnt umber, sorry. Okay, we're going to shade our leaves with a float of plantation pine, I think. Yep, plantation pine. And then chop that color right on into those little serrated edges of the leaves. some of the edges of our leaves. We don't want to outline them all the way or anything. Just some of those edges could be nice and a little bit darker. And then we'll use our dry, um, this is, whoops, stained. That's not actually red. And we'll load 
some plantation pine on a dry, dry, dry brush and rub off everything that we can. And then in the center area, I'll dry rub some of that dark. This is dry rub. And just rub right here in the center with light pressure when you begin so that you don't make a mess. And you don't want to make circles. I'm going to just deepen the color of those leaves. Use your soapstone or trace your pattern on to establish which grapes are on top. And I want that to be, I want that to be on top right there. It's not a good idea to have those intersections happen right in the center of a bunch of grapes. It's a bad idea. Oops. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to shade with mauve. So you'll just float. Oops, too much water. And float underneath the separations with the mauve color. I'm going to keep it round, so go ahead after you slice it in there, go ahead and round it out a little bit like that. And then don't cut through them while you're doing them because then they will. Um, wipe off your float. Here. Establish all your little sections. Around. If they're not round, and then they're going to be funky looking grapes. Got my belt on top of that one. Yeah, that can be there. Okay, now once we've got this on and they're all dried, we want to go ahead. Oh, what's going on with this poor guy right here? float on the grapes, keeping a circular shape, so you use like a C-stroke type in effect. Just nice and washy. We don't want to take over with the color. Forget that you can turn your piece over see, as you need to. Wash on the letters. Oops, with thinned burnt umber. Just keep it nice and within the lines. Okay, then you're going to shade on the left side with the bittersweet chocolate. just a little bit of antique maroon to the um, left sides grapes to deepen the shadows deepen the color just a little bit and we can even take a little bit of this stuff and bring it out here on our little leaf areas just to accent those. 
not everywhere, just here and there. And we can bring a little bit into our lettering. Just up the middle, maybe. Okay, I like that. That deepens everything. We're going to use bleach sand and one of our dry scumbly stencil brushes. Wipe everything off, put on my glasses, and then just we're going to give this stone a little bit more of the white in there, just a little. Stay out of your dark areas that you established. That's just going to make it not be so. So brown looking. It's getting a little dingy. And dirty stones. Okay, we're going to take that same bleach sand and we're going to add little scumbles of dry rub on our grapes. Here and there. Start in your brightest area so that you have very little paint left when you get to the, the other areas. Okay, I've got my yellow light out and I've got it nice and blended on a flat brush and then I'm going to just tint some of these little grapes, kind of keeping it on my darker ones. Let's just warm them up just ever so slightly. These top ones. Okay, and then we want to go onto our leaves just on the areas that face into the centers and accent them with just a little bit of yellow. Just where they fall to the middle. Over. Oops, I flipped my brush over too. It's just a little bit brighter. Okay, we're going to sprinkle a little bit of the yellow light on our stones here and there where there would be some like sunlight dappling through just a little bit on some of the corners keeping it kind of over here in the center of interest and then kind of rub it a little bit we don't want it to be maybe tickle a little teeny bit into some of the corners it's just as to give them a little bit of a jazz Get the leaves a little bit more if you think you need it. I think my grapes look like they need just a little bit more effort on the antique maroon. So I'm going to go ahead and give them just a little bit more depth. A pop. Yeah, that's better. There we go. I'm happy with that. Okay, I'm going to sprinkle a little bit more of the antique maroon around in these corners on the outside. Kind of frame it and share that color just a little bit. 
just as you need. Okay, we're going to spatter. You're going to take a little nugget of wood, and your rake brush, and spatter those corners. Stay out of the center area. Always test your spatters off um, when you're spattering. Test them, um, you know, smack them off onto your palette so that you end up not over spattering things. It knocks off any kind of loose. If you anchor, anchor your um, piece that you're spattering against, it gives you a little bit more control about where the spatters are going. If you don't want them on your grapes, wipe them off. Repeat with a little bit of black. The black will be more where, make sure that it's where the other spatters are so it's not sitting there by itself looking real strong. And then finally a little of that bleached, um, that bleached color. And that can go kind of everywhere. <coughs> and maybe we do want a little bit of that color in the um, in the center of this. I forgot that I was making this a label, so I went ahead and washed a little bit of um, buttermilk over this area, avoiding the areas I'd already slip slapped. I'm going to use my burnt umber, which I need fresh because it's empty. And I'm going to float the details. around this outside edge here. So I want this to be like the paper is shading it. So it'll get skinny where the paper gets flat. And then as the paper bends up, I get a little bit thicker. Maybe like the little edges of the paper. So we're going to do that around the whole thing. And we're also going to want um, to shade. It's a little trickier when you're inside a tray like this. We're going to want to shade the edges of our little tray here. And I don't have a very good float right now, so I'm going to just rub that. We're going to want to do the same effect to this stone area as we did on the top, but this is the stone sitting underneath this label right here. So we'll float around all the edges and then we'll make them look like they're um, their cracked stones and stuff on the edges of them. I'm going to go ahead and use the bittersweet chocolate and thin it with water for the lettering. I'm going to use the bittersweet chocolate and we're going to float to get this building under here. Try not to run through your floats. Just nice and transparent. I'll float some ground under there. It's a very washed look because this is like a faded old wine label. Oops, keep it straight. It's a building after all. Okay. 
put on some windows. Maybe we'll make that an arched doorway, more Italian looking. A little chimney. And float on some trees, those kind of Italian looking trees. And the wine label, I'm going to wash on your letter, and we're going to make a viney border around this oval. Just to frame it. And, you know, have some of it go off wonky and stuff. Trim your letter so that it's darkest on the right side. All right now, with stronger paint, go over the contrasting. Just for a little bit of interest, go ahead and beef up these lines. Time to deepen the colors just like we did on the top. Use our plantation pine to beef up our leaves. The color's just a nice a little bit more strong on the edges. Brighten up some of that. And we've got our antique maroon. And float those grapes. And then I'll just deepen these guys up. These grapes are a lot less detailed, so it's not as important what kind of um, what kind of work you do on them. Just getting some color in there. Although we don't want it that bright. Okay, and on this side, same thing. I have a strong, strong float on here. Okay, and we also want to go ahead and highlight or shade our line as it pokes through. And I think let's go ahead and tint this R in here with the, a little bit of that pink as well. And 
Give this a little bit of a tint down here as well. Go into our yellow. And beef everything up just a little bit with yellow. Just a little bit in the buildings. in the middle of the arm. We're going to go ahead and give the corners just a little... Where are we? Let's go ahead and give the corners just a little tickle of this color as well. And then we'll go ahead and scatter. And let's try and get it in the corners. Stand up. Turn your piece if you need to get a different angle on those spatters. And turn all the, do all the sides. Be careful, there's spatters on your table now, and that means that you'll have, um, you'll pick up spatters on your piece, and you don't want to smear things, so you might want to make sure to dry before you flip things around. Okay, so like, I wouldn't want to flip it on this side, because now there's wet spatters down there. So I can work on the inside while I'm doing that. And on the center area, maybe we'll spatter with a little bit of that bleached sand. 